Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I'm Dr. Ravinder Kaur. I'm um, Director Professor and HOD in Department of Microbiology. I'll be talking to you today about mycology, medical mycology, introduction to medical mycology and how to diagnose diseases of, uh, uh, caused by fungi. Now medical mycology is basically a study of fungi and diseases caused by them. The word mycology comes from mycus which means mushroom. Now mushroom is one of the fungi which you all are aware of, it is used as a foodstuff. We use it in our food. It's an exotic food which is used. And fungus is a Latin word used for mushroom only. Now, as far as the history goes, though bacteria have been recognized earlier, but fungi also have gone back in the past because they were, they, but they received less attention because of the relatively benign nature of the disease. Now, they were diagnosed as early as 1800s. Candida, Aspergillus, Favors and others were diagnosed, but not much importance was given to them. But over the period of time with control of bacterial diseases and use of antibiotics as well as steroids and immunosuppressive drugs, these fungi have been causing diseases which need to be taken care of. Now as far as their properties are concerned, they are eukaryotic organisms which could be unicellular or multicellular. They resemble plants but differ from them because they cannot, they do not have chlorophyll, so they are, they cannot make food of their own. They have cell walls with chitin but no cellulose, cell membranes have augustirol and they usually grow as saprophytes or parasites. Many species are known but only about 300 species are the ones which are known as pathogenic to be man. When we try to differentiate between bacteria and fungi, we find bacteria are prokaryotic while young fungi are eukaryotic. Further, fungi are multilayered. They have chitin, glucans, mannan, polysaccharide, and peptide capsules seen in some members. While muramic and hecoic acid, peptidoglycon, are the ones which are usually seen in bacteria. Lipopolysaccharide capsule could be seen in some of the bacteria. Plasma leba, in case of fungi, contains agosterol except in pneumocystis, while the bacteria they lack the agosterol. Then bacteria, they lack the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria in their cell walls while these are present in the cell wall, in the cytoplasm of the fungi. Fungi have a true nucleus with nuclear membrane and paired chromosomes while bacteria have a single chromosome and with no nuclear membrane. Also, fungi can have different morphological forms. They can be yeast-like, they can be mold-like, they can grow at different temperatures while bacteria are usually cocoid, bacillary, filamentous, branching different forms are also seen. Fungi multiply by asexual as well as sexual reproduction while bacteria multiply only they have non-reproductive endospores and they multiply only by binary fission. Fungi can be stained by different staining techniques compared to bacteria which we will be talking to you in detail in later slides. As far as the fungi are concerned, I told you they cannot make a food of their own. So they need to absorb food that is they need rather than ingesting it. Also, they grow at a pH, which is an acidic pH. They grow better at that compared to bacteria. Mostly, they are aerobic. That is, they grow in the presence of air, but they can be a facultative anaerobes also. They are more resistant to high osmotic pressure than bacteria. They can grow on substances with very low moisture. They also require less nitrogen than bacteria to grow, and they can break down almost anything in the nature to grow. So, they can be, they are good saprophytes. Two morphological forms are mainly seen. One is yeast, which is unicellular, oval or spherical cells. These are, they could be any of them. Or they could be molds, which are multicellular and they are usually filamentous forms. And these individual filaments are known as hyphae. The yeast, they reproduce by fission. That is, the central separation could be there and which uh, uh, produces two such yeasts. This occurs in Penicillium manifi or they could reproduce by budding, that is uneven small buds which come out, this occurs in candida and saccharomyces. On the other hand, 
these CE cells can sometimes get elongated that is they can form long cells and then such long cells in a row can look like filament or a hypha or a filament mycelium structure it could look like but they differ from hyphae because at the point of where they connect to the wall there is a constriction seam sometimes they form germ tubes that is then extension from yeast cell so a tube like structure comes out when you grow them in serum media yeast they also multiply by i told you asexually as well as sexually now the yeast when they multiply by asexual spores they are known as blastospores usually this is by budding you will see that there are buds which comes out and they get pinched off from the main cell and this is individual bud can act as a parent cell so these are blastospores the same when they get elongated they form pseudohyphae but there's a constriction in between the cell and the main cell and the smaller cell while a true hypha there is no constriction seen so this is how differentiate from pseudohypha also mold when it is seen it could be filamentous like i told you they are large filamental mass of hyphae now either they can have septations then they are known as septate mycelia or they could be just a cytoplasm flowing through and through that is no septations and they are known as non septate mycelia individual portion of the cell or the mycelium is a hypha individual vegetative filament is known as hypha and it is also the actively growing assimilative phase usually the walls of these are parallel you will see of the hyphae and the diameter of the hypha is useful in distinguishing different fungi zygomycetes are the ones which have maximum diameter that is 10 to 15 micron and this is how you uh, differentiate them from other fungi now the hyphae which i told you they are long filaments of cells so they could be septate or non septate this is what i told you earlier but you can see them under the microscope like this that is you will have septations or you will have no septations now mold or the fungi which produce mycelia they are also known as molds now these hyphae usually they are hyaline that is they have no color of their own but sometimes they can be pigmented dark colored then they are known as pheoid hyphae and also hyphae are distinguished on the basis of whether they are submerging or growing into the medium that is the hyphae which are known as vegetative hyphae or the ones which are exposed to the air or the fertile hyphae or the aerial hyphae now the in addition to these structures they also can have certain other structures which help in identification of the bacteria uh, the fungi or also they help in the fungi tiding over difficult conditions they could be chlamydospores now these chlamydospores they are usually the cells when they have enough nutrition of their own they become rounded they have a thick wall around them and they can you know individually grow separately as individual hyphae or individual fungi they can be terminal when they are at the end of the hypha they could be intercalary when they are in between the cells or they could be sessile when they are on the hypha they are bone on the side each individual chlamydospore can act as a reproductive unit similarly arthrospores are there which are unicellular vegetative spores where many set up what happens is that these uh, fi, um, mycelium is there this hypha is there which has got rectangular cells so some of the cells the cell wall thickens and they separate out while the individual cells in between they degenerate so what happens is this occurs when a fungus is not getting enough nutrition so these individual arthrospores they can separate out and individually act as full parent bodies and later develop into new hyphae so this is how a fungus tides over difficult conditions in addition to this they can have certain special hyphal structures which help you in identification seeing those special structures in a fungal uh, microscopy you can identify the particular fungus like in case of trichophyton mentegrophytes you will see the spiral hyphae spiral structures in microsporum ardini you will see these pectinate like bodies you will see favic chandelier appearance in some hyphae or you will see in some uh, mycelia suddenly the cells become nodular become thickened this is known as nodular organ which is seen in microsporum canis or they could form structures like tennis rackets in and this is seen in epidermophyton floccosum so if you see structures like this under the microscope you would think that this is epidermophyton so it helps you to identify a fungus now as far as reproduction is concerned fungal spores they are formed by sexual and as well as asexual reproduction sexual spores are usually formed by fusion of the two opposite mating strains of the same species while asexual spores are formed on the aerial hyphae now the aerial hyphae the sexual spores can be formed either within a sac like structure which is a sporangium 
and the spores within the sporangium are known as sporangiospores. The, this can burst and the sporangiospores can come out in the air and individually they can go and germinate. Or they could be unicellular microconidia in the case of penicillium and all or they could be multicellular in that case they are macroconidia that is multicelled macroconidia and which can individually germinate and produce new fungi. As far as the morphological classification is concerned, fungi could be either yeast, yeast like, molds or dimorphic fungi. Now what do we understand? Yeast I have told you earlier also, it is what? It is a unicellular form of the fungus and usually there are no pseudo, when there are no pseudo hyphacine or then it is known as a true yeast and such fungi are the cryptococcus neoformans. Yeast like it is called when there are pseudo hyphae and hyphacine, this is seen in candida species. Molds on the other hand, they exist as mycelial forms. This can occur in any of the bread molds, aspergillus, penicillium, rhizopus, etc. While the dimorphic fungi is another class of fungi which can grow in two forms. That is why it is known as dimorphic fungi. At 37 degrees centigrade, they are present in the yeast form or unicellular form. And at room temperature or 25 degrees centigrade, they form molds or seen as mycelia. This is usually seen in the systemic fungi which are causing systemic mycosis and histoplasma, blastomyces, sporothric shinkai, medicinium anaphi are some of the ones which act as dimorphic fungi. Pheoid fungi are what? The fungi which have pigmentation in the cell wall or which are colored or which are dark. They are known as pheoid hyphae or demistitious fungi. Now, some of these are yeast like on primary isolation, then in that case what will happen is the yeast itself will also be black colored. So, then they are known as black yeast. And they are these difficult pronouncing names like Oreobacidium pullonans, Vagnella, Exophylla and others which are these pheoid fungi. Systematic classification can also be done based on sexual spores which could be zygospores then it is known as zygomycetes, ascospores then it is ascomycetes, basidiospore if they form then they are known as basidiomycetes and there is one deuteromycetes or fungi imperfecti where the sexual stage is not known. Now, in zygomycetes, I told you the mating fungi of the same species, they come together and they form a sac-like structure, they mate together and they could form a sporangium. Now, this sporangium has sporangiospores in it. These are usually seen in non-septate hyphae, which could be rhizopus, mucor or apsidium. Ascomycetes on the other hand means spores within an ascus or within a sac-like structure, ascus, eight or more spores could be present within the sac-like structure. Or they could be present in chains like a cousin, penicillium and aspergillus. Then they are known as conidia. Mesidiomycetes, what are they? They are sexual spores. Usually they are four spores formed on the apex of a base-like structure, basidium structure. This is a sexual structure and they are in, seen in phylobasididia and in sporotrichum. Deuteromycetes, I told you, are the ones where no sexual stage is determined and they are usually most fungi of medical importance belong to this. <clears throat> so, as far as the pathogenic classification is concerned, you have to understand some fungi are primarily pathogenic that is they cause infection in healthy individuals, while there are other th others which will cause infection only when the patient is immunocompromised that is this fungus will be present in the environment, you, you mucor, rhizopus is present in the environment, but most of us are not getting the disease. Why? Because we are enough competence, immunocompetence to be able to fight it. But when we are immunocompromised due to any reason, then we can get predisposed to these infections. So, fungal diseases could be either infection, in that case they are known as mycosis or they could be hypersensitivity related diseases, that is you develop an allergy to fungal spores like occurs in the case of Aspergillus fumigatus and we develop a disease known as ABPA which is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Or you could develop mycotoxicosis, in which case what happens is there are certain fungi like Aspergillus flavors, Claviceps purpura which produce toxic metabolites and they can produce disease like aflatoxicosis or other agotism in a human being. Or sometimes what can happen is that there are enough preformed toxins in the food, this occurs in mushroom poisoning and then in that case it is known as mitosism. Now, as if you want to classify the mycosis, they could either be superficial or deep. Superficial can be surface or cutaneous, while deep could be subcutaneous or systemic. Then the further systemic could be mainly primary, that is the primarily pathogenic ones or the opportunistic infections. 
So, the fungi when how the transmission occurs, how does the patient get an inf infection? Either one can get it through inhalation which occurs in most systemic fungi like I told you earlier or dermatophytes by contact they can lead on to infection or sometimes if you have a traumatic inoculation, so you have a wound and a spore comes and gets lodged on it then mycetoma and other diseases can develop or opportunistic fungi could cause systemic invasion by entry say a patient who is on steroids or who has some treatment going on and the fungus gets lodged and that causes disease. Now we need to diagnose these fungal infections and to diagnose these fungal infections first of all there has to be a big clinical suspicion. You have to be very sure that a patient could be suffering from a fungal infection and because most of these fungal infections you have to realize they do not have any pathognomonic clinical signs and symptoms. So, just by any typical sign and symptom you cannot say that this is a fungal disease. So, only when a patient say he is not responding to antibiotics or due to other reasons you think it is a fungal disease then you will look for the particular fungus that you could think that could be causing the disease. Now, in that case depending on whether it is a respiratory disease you will take respiratory samples or it is a skin disease you will take a skin sample, skin scrapings, nail infection can occur you will take a nail sample, hair samples in case it is a hair infection or depending on where, whichever side the infection if it is a CNS infection you will take CSF samples. So, the right sample needs to be collected and enough amount of the sample needs to be collected. After the sample is collected it is sent to the lab where we do first thing is direct examination. Now, KOH examination is usually done for samples like skin scrapings, nails and all where there is a keratin structure there. So, keratin is usually a very difficult structure to dissolve, but KOH dissolves the keratinolytic agent, it dissolves this K, uh, keratin and allows better visualization of these fungi. Or you could do calcofluor white staining which binds to the cellulose and chitin of the fungal cell walls and these fluorous like white fluorous under UV light. Or you could do negative staining in which case the capsule does not get stained but it gets more um, visualized. Further sometimes you are getting tissue samples. Now, how do you need to diagnose tissue samples? In them you will need to do histopathological staining which could be h &E staining, pass staining which stains only live fungi or it could be the silver staining which stains both live and dead fungi. Then you could do Meyer's mucicamine staining and other stains. I will show you how they look. h &E stain the fungus if it is there it could tell you that the fungus is invasive or there is a silver staining in which the dark colored fungi they are there which can be identified sometime by their morphology also or pass stain where the yeast is identified by the color that it takes. In case of mucicamine stain the capsule here in cryptococcus neoformans it is getting stained. Further for diagnosis you need to culture them. For culturing with a uh, medium that is used is Sabrod's Rexroseger and this is usually taken in a slide in a tube or a bottle. Why? Because we need to incubate for up till 4 to 6 weeks. If you have in a plate usually the medium will dry. So, a fungal thing you need to put it in a medium in a tube so that it is not dehydrated and the uh, dextrose agar it has more dextrose than the normal uh, media which are growing bacteria also the pH is low it is 5.6. Sometimes you need to add antibiotics to it so that the bacteria do not overgrow over the fungi or you add cyclohexamide to prevent the growth of saprophytes. Then depending on whether the organism how the growth is taking place whether it is woolly growth, pasty growth, what colored growth it is, whether there is pigmentation seen or not the what we do is we make a smear from the uh, culture which is either by tease mount technique or a cellophane technique or by slide culture and an LCB mount is made. Now, what is LCB mount? It is lactophenol cotton blue mount in which case lactic acid is preserving the morphology, cotton blue is staining it blue, glycerol prevents the drying of the fungus and phenol acts as a disinfectant. So, it stains blue like this the structures. Further depending on the presence of or absence of septa, presence of asexual structures, presence of special structures like pectinate hyphae and others you identify the different fungi. Sometimes you need to diagnose fast like a patient who has got cryptococcal meningitis you want to diagnose as early as possible. So, if you take a CSF sample you can look for antigen by doing latex agglutination or in case of aspergillus and dermatophyte infection sometimes you can look for antibodies. In pneumocystis infection which causes a pneumonia in HIV patients if you take a sputum sample you can do a direct fluorescent staining and you can detect within um, within a time of one hour whether the patient has got pneumocystis infection or not. 
You could also look for fungal metabolites or you could do molecular testing, but molecular testing is not so well developed or advanced in fungal infections. Skin testing is done sometimes for delayed hypersensitivity because these fungi usually they um, uh, the fungal infections are mediated by cell mediated immunity. So, by showing this response on skin, you could show that a patient is suffering from a systemic infection or not. So, these are the different ways by which we diagnose fungal infections. Now, fungal infections are there on the four. We have to learn to diagnose them. More and more patients are getting infected by fungi. And another thing important which we need to know is that there are very few antifungal agents. So, the earlier we diagnose, the better it is for the patients. Thank you.